Hi, everybody. Welcome to session five. I can't believe it's session five already. Um, thank you so much for those of you um, joining us for the first or the fifth time. It's a real treat to have you here. And um, we're super excited to be offering this, this series in honor of the 100th anniversary of the Lincoln Memorial coming up very soon now in May of, of 2022. So we'll be doing um, all kinds of special activities throughout the month of May at the Lincoln Memorial. And um, we, we started doing all of this so that we could engage with teachers and hopefully get teachers and students excited about this anniversary and thinking about the Lincoln Memorial. And so we have, we have uh, focused on a lot of different subjects and we're going a little bit different today and I'm super excited. But before I get ahead of myself, I'm going to throw this to Aaron, who is with the Trust for the National Mall, who has been our super great sponsor of all of this by offering up the Zoom space for us. And um, Aaron, go ahead. Thanks so much, Jen. And thank you so much, Sonia, for joining us today. I'm so excited to hear what you have to say. Um, my name is Aaron Plant. I'm a public engagement coordinator at the Trust for the National Mall, which is the lead nonprofit philanthropic partner of the National Park Service here on the National Mall. Our mission is to restore, enrich, and preserve, and we're honored to do that by working with Jen and our other National Park Service friends to share the powerful stories on the mall with you, and are just thankful for what you all do as educators to bring those stories into classrooms. Um, if you enjoy tonight's program, you can see our past Lincoln 100 at uh, teacher workshop sessions and other virtual classroom experiences on our website, nationalmall.org, under the Explore tab. And I also want to invite you all to bring your classrooms to our next virtual classroom experience this Tuesday, March 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern Time in honor of Women's History Month. And it's going to be on the 50th anniversary of the passing of the Equal Rights Amendment. We'll be hosting Ranger Susan Philpott of the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument, who will lead your students in exploration of changing ideas about equality, uh, from, the mass, from the passing of the 19th Amendment to the passing of the ERA and what the future might bring. So with that, I'm so excited to hear a new angle of the Lincoln Memorial story. Um, thank you so much again, Sonia, for being here. And back to you, Jen. Thank you, Erin, for um, being such a great partner for us in this series. Um, and so glad to have you uh, with us tonight. Um, this is so cool. So uh, Ranger Sonia and I have known each other a long time, longer than I realized. Um, but we look exactly the same as we did when we met 20 years ago. Um, but um, this was one of the first things I thought of uh, when we were thinking about the Lincoln Memorial and how we could engage students that we focus so much on the history of this. And um, mainly because that's what I know best. <laughs> and science has never been one of my strong suits, but I'm really trying. And when we were thinking about ideas, I was like, oh man, I wish Sonia was still working at the National Mall because it would be great to have her come and talk about her idea from a long time ago that you could combine the story of history with geology because Sonia is a geologist. And uh, I sent her an email one night and I said, hey, this is a really crazy idea, but what would you think about doing a program like next year, a long time away about um, your geo story idea at the Lincoln Memorial in honor of the hundredth? And she was like, sign me up. And I was like, done. <laughs> so um, super excited to have Sonia here today. She, as you may have guessed, worked at the mall a long time ago and has graciously agreed to come and um, think back about her fond years in Washington, DC. I'm gonna let her tell you where she is now because I think she's gonna win the award for the furthest away speaker we've had in this series. Um, and I'm just really so glad to see you again and have you join us today. So thank you, Sonia, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Erin, thank you, Jen. I'm so honored to be part of this series. And um, it is a true walk down memory lane, a really far walk down many memories. <laughs> and uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to do today um, uh, is to talk about magma, fossils, stalactites, a meteor impact crater, and of course, Abraham Lincoln. Um, I am talking to you from a monument. Oh, here we go, if I can get there we go. 
I'm talking to you from Dinosaur National Monument currently. I had worked on the National Mall in Washington, DC for four years but from 2001 through 2005. And then I've worked in other national parks since then. My current location is right on the border of Utah and Colorado at a place where there are, no surprise, some dinosaur fossils in a place called Dinosaur National Monument. The primary resource and where people focus their visit is a place called the Quarry Exhibit Hall. And it is a building built over the top of the rock that has so many dinosaur fossils in it that even after 15 years of excavation, there was still enough left over to justify building a brand new kind of museum. One where the rock is on display in place where 1500 individually cataloged dinosaur fossils all from the Jurassic period are all jumbled up together. Um, you could say it's like a log jam of dinosaur bones preserved in the sandstone of a Jurassic age riverbed. So we engage a lot of youth and students and a lot of the educational activities are taking place at the quarry in person. Uh, but we also do virtual field trips. This is Ranger Tiffany up on the bone wall with some of our favorite props. Um, who doesn't love being able to use plastic dinosaurs routinely at work? Um, so here Tiffany is just with an iPad um, connecting with students, who knows where. We get requests for these field trips across the country and across the globe. Other activities that students can do or teachers um, uh, bringing students or just families visiting are going out and seeing all of those fossils in place. And this is my nephew um, a long time ago, also a little walk down memory lane. And he is pointing out and finding one of the dinosaur fossils that are out in the wild, out on the fossil discovery trail. And this is what a lot of natural history parks um, are really known for having those authentic resource-based experiences with, with geology and geologic processes out in the landscape where they happen. Uh, here I am in my natural habitat up on the top of Split Mountain. This is part of Dinosaur National Monument's river systems as well. And it's just a fantastic place where knowing what the rock is doing underneath your feet can help understand how it affects the climate and the weather system and the soil types and the plants and the animals and the ecology and then the human history that falls into place. This is really obvious when you're in a place like dinosaur where the primary resource is very geology focused. Uh, but what happens when a uh, geology major uh, ends up getting a job as a park ranger in Washington, DC? Uh, you may think that my most natural habitat there was the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Uh, and sure, I loved it there. Um, and in fact, if you look down towards the bottom of this image and use this red pointer, you see this little teaser of a dinosaur. This is a banner that was in place in 2017 when I last visited Washington, DC, they're completely re redoing their, um, their dinosaur hall. And I believe it's done now. Um, one of the bones or a few of the bones that are in that dinosaur hall in the Smithsonian are actually from, you know, out just out my office window here. I could go walk up to the place where those bones came from. Um, these photos are from the early 1900s, 1909. The very first dinosaur bones were found at Dinosaur. Here is a little ridge. That's what they were doing. They were just sticking out. And over time, they were collected. They were taken out of the rock, packaged up, shipped across the United States. A lot of them ended up in the, in the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania but a good number of them ended up in the Smithsonian as well in Washington, DC. So do me a favor, if you're in the DC area, go and say hi to the Camarasaurus that is uh, from Jensen, Utah, down in that hall. Um, and while you're there, don't forget to say hi to my other favorite fossil, the humble crinoid. Crinoids are a, um, a type of e e 
um, like a like a sea star fan. It's in the sea star family and echinoderm, and they are sometimes known as sea lilies. They look like plants, but they're actually animals. They are filter feeders, and they lived and live on the bottom of shallow seas. And the most amazing thing about crinoids is they're really easy to find. Um, and can you see? Anything in this picture that looks fossiliferous to you? Right here is a nice big crinoid. Looks kind of like a Cheerio. <laughs> Sometimes you can get a bunch of them all stacked up together. There are pieces of the stem of that crinoid um, that look like these little Cheerios. There's also parts of bryozoans and brachiopods, all evidence of former life. This happens to be a photo from the Lincoln Memorial. It is just inside on the interior wall of the Indiana limestone. Um, if you're walking up the steps and then you see Lincoln right in front of you and you turn to your right on that wall is where you can find this beautiful example of former life. So that got me thinking, okay. So what if people don't need to go to a big natural history park or outdoor area to see geology and enjoy it? What if they don't even have to go to a natural history museum and see where it's on display? What if we can look in other places in our built environments? And how can we use the Lincoln Memorial as an outdoor classroom, not only for history, but also for art and earth science? So what I'd like to do uh, today is make the case that rocks hold their own stories that led to des desirable qualities for building. That's pretty obvious. They're strong. They have different qualities that make them so they don't burn like wood. Um, they could be readily available in some places, at least. And local sources were being used for different um, construction materials around the country. But something special happens in Washington, DC with all the monuments and memorials. And the building stones are often also strengthening the cultural themes and symbols. And finally, geologic events that occurred millions of years ago continue to impact us today. And that's something that um, is an interesting concept to explore no matter where you are. So let's start looking at the Lincoln Memorial as a case study for looking at geology and starting off with the three types of rocks. Um, depending on what age you teach or are or remember, uh, types of rocks are usually something that an elementary school classroom will review, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. And all three types of rocks are on display at the Lincoln Memorial. Let's start out with igneous. Igneous rock means uh, fire formed um, or ignite. And it starts with magma, also molten rock, um, undeep in the Earth's core sometimes. And it comes closer up to the surface. And if it doesn't quite break through, but it has a time to cool and harden, it can form a rock called granite. Now, the building blocks of any rock are minerals. And here's a close up of three very common minerals found in granite. Um, kind of that flaky, darker colored um, uh, mica. We have the pinkish color feldspar and then that white crystal of quartz. Individual mineral crystals come together, cool and harden. And the natural surface of the granite can be kind of bumpy, but something, um, something special happens when you cut it and polish it. It can change its appearance quite, um, quite a bit. So we find granite being used in several memorials. Uh, this is one that shows a difference in the cooling speed. So if you have that magma and it cools and hardens quickly, the individual mineral crystals don't have as much time to develop, so they're smaller. And they might look like some of these, like this lower area in this photo. But sometimes there's a little pocket and it's warmer and then it uh, takes longer to cool. And then the different minerals have a time to separate out and crystallize and you might get a bigger chunk. Feldspar here, quartz over here. Uh, does anyone recognize this right off the bat? Uh, 
from a particular memorial with that color and that texture. It is from the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial. And um, this was part of a bike tour that um, I was, was able to do. And the FDR Memorial quickly became my favorite um, because the rock was so unassuming and purposeful. Uh, granite is a very common rock type and it was not trying to be you know, neoclassical in any way. It was blending in with the natural environment and the roughness and the texture helped tell the story also. And if you looked really, really, really close, which I did one day, um, because sometimes as a geologist, surrounded by stories of history and a bunch of rocks, and if it's a slow day, um, and it's kind of boring. You just, you know, you have to make your own fun. And uh, I started looking really, really closely at the granite at the FDR Memorial, and I found a little quartz vein. And uh, so quartz is something that will fill in cracks and crevices and stay liquid longer. And uh, along this quartz vein, then I found that little blob of um, pyrite. It's fool's gold. It is a, it's considered a hydrothermal mineral and it tied in, in my mind, to the FTR story because of the hot springs and the therapeutic qualities of the, of the hydrothermal activity that was happening um, uh, in, in um, places where FTR was, was getting some, um, it, being in the pools and, and um, treating, treating his health. And, that got that got a little bit more uh, ideas running of how many other stories could kind of sort of be connected in a way, at least entertaining to uh, entertain. What so, room is that? Do you remember? Yeah, I, remember um, I know exactly where it is. It is now we all um, have to go look. I think it's the first room. So it's you've just started. You've you've come across the plaza and you see um, FDR in his chair. And then you enter into the first term, and I believe it's that first wall. Um, I, I have another context picture, but I, I figured you, we only needed so many pictures of me on a bike. <laughs> but I can send you another one. Uh, or the challenge is, you got time. And go on, go, go and find it. It's a, it's, a, it's a hunt for gold. It's fool's gold. Pyrite is not actually gold, uh, but the hunt for fool's gold is on at the FTR Memorial. Um, cherry blossom next week. So we'll all yeah. be out there looking. Perfect. Um, and then while you're out there, you could also look for the granite blocks that look a little different. So the majority of the granite that is at the FTR Memorial is this kind of uh, reddish color. It's called the carnelian granite and it's from um, Millbank, South Dakota. Uh, this block that's in the center here this is not a great, um, a great image. It's the best I could come up with, um, but it actually is much more gray. It would have hardened from magma that had a slightly different chemical um, composition. Um, it cooled maybe a little faster than the carnelian granite because the mineral crystals are actually a little bit smaller. You can still identify them with the naked eye though. Uh, and it looks very different like this rough cut. Exactly the same rock is also used here. The Korean War Veterans Memorial has a polish on it that makes the um, images reflect. And the images reflecting, of course, are us today as we look in, as well as the statues um, to complete the story and the symbolism of that memorial in place. Um, you can get a completely different feel, a completely different mood, depending on what rock you choose. That goes even a little bit deeper, a little bit darker at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial where this rock actually came from India. The one, um, the one at the Korean War Veterans Memorial came from California. Uh, this one came from India, specifically so it could be the darkest, and uh, the most reflective once it got that high polish. And this is where, this is where the rocks are really important for setting that mood. 
causing that actual reflection that is so critical at these, at these places. So switching gears, we're gonna to go to a different rock type, um, sedimentary limestone. So sedimentary rock is made out of bits and pieces of things, um, little sediments. And in the case of the wall in the back um, and around all the sides at the Lincoln Memorial and the columns, there's a close up of the column and see those little chunky things. Ooh, here's our friend the trinoid again. Um, this is the Indiana limestone and the Indiana limestone is used in a lot of buildings. Um, uh, almost all of Federal Triangle, um, a lot of interior structures, the inside of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, um, the reflecting pool at the, um, near, the, um, uh, near the Capitol has some awesome uh, fossils popping out of, of that one. And it is, you can think of it like natural concrete. It's lime, sediment, and um, a lot of calcium. The calcium that comes from the bodies of those ancient sea creatures that were alive, in this case, 300 million years ago, a warm ocean was covering Indiana. It has since turned into um, rock that has been a really great building material for, for decades. Again, it's, it's ready-made, it's like, Ready-made blocks, it's strong. You can make things that are tall and they're not gonna burn. But what really, I think, becomes really interesting uh, when you look at what is happening in this limestone, the words of Lincoln, Lincoln's words from the second inaugural address shown here and also the Gettysburg Address, they are, they're carved into that limestone and the limestone is alive. The limestone is, is full of life, um, just like these words live on. So look outside now. Uh, what happens if something like limestone um, suddenly experiences a lot of heat and pressure? Metamorphic rock is rock that changes over time. And a lot of times it's heat related, pressure related, a combination of both. And it just takes one type of rock and it completely transforms into something else. Um, why marble and why white marble for the Lincoln Memorial? Well, does anybody recognize this building? What better way to make a young nation um, and a new capital city feel a lot older um, than hearkening back to landmarks of civilization and some of these structures that we see it, on the Acropolis. Uh, the Greek Parthenon is the inspiration for the structure of the, of the Lincoln Memorial, um, not only in its shape, but also in its material. So it just so happens there's a lot of marble available for building structures in Italy and in Greece and in the areas where you could get that building material to the Acropolis. Uh, therefore, we've got these white marble structures. Um, P.S. These and um, some of these uh, structures in Rome were likely painted lots of different colors. So what we see as this classical, clean, white, bright look um, actually might look a little naked to the, the people who made these so long ago. But for, for us, this neoclassical approach is directly influenced by this white rock. So when Henry Bacon, the architect for the Lincoln Memorial is looking for white rock, he doesn't want just any white rock. He wants rock that is snowy white, that doesn't have a little, lot of little lines and squiggles in it like some marble does. And he needs, he needs rock that's strong and can withstand um, the construction that he needs it to do. It needs to hold itself up. And I had the chance to actually visit the location where the exterior marble from the Lincoln Memorial was quarried from. It's this beautiful little mountain town and see what looks like snow in the backgrounds. 
It's actually chunks of marble. Uh, <laughs> my favorite thing here is this little sign or scribble on the rock that says trail. And then if you look, here's an arrow, just in case you're wondering where to go next. Um, at this time, I was actually able to walk up to the quarry. It was not, um, it was not an active quarry at that, at that point and get right up to the mouth of it. Um, a friend of mine is in the lower right-hand corner for scale. You can see how big that opening is. Um, it really showcases how the rock can look very different on the surface. It's weathered, it's gray, kind of rusty looking. Um, but when you cut into the earth itself, you can reveal these gorgeous chunks of white marble. And nowhere else have I found a more well-placed geologic description than this sign that was posted right at the entry of this, uh, this quarry. And I'll, and I'll read it because I think it's a little fuzzy. Uh, the Yule marble is a rare occurrence of an almost pure white stone that has remained relatively free of fractures. The ability to obtain large blocks of white stone is what makes the Yule marble marketable throughout the world, even though it's located more than a thousand miles from the nearest seaport. It was formed by the deposition of calcium and carbon on a large seabed which covered this area of the world. Virtually no other sediments were deposited, which is why the sediment is so white. The sediments are buried over time and compressed to form a 200 foot thick bed of limestone. Granite intrusions above and below the limestone metamorphosed the stone so that it was recrystallized to form 99% pure calcium carbonate. Whoa. So this is high quality marble. Uh, it's up on the top of a mountain in a tiny town in Colorado. So there were definitely some uh, challenges, we'll say, to get it to market. Um, samples of this marble were were um, brought in to Washington DC and they, they, um, they made it, they made the test. And you're like, all right, I don't care. It's gonna be expensive. It's gonna be tough, but uh, let's do it. Only 10% of the marble quarried during the time when the contract for the Lincoln Memorial was active at this particular quarry made the strict standards of actually making it to the Lincoln Memorial. But never fear, you can find blocks of this around in lots of other buildings. Um, you can also find um, the this, this same marble for these same qualities was selected for the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So at the time when the Lincoln Memorial was being constructed, we had some options transportation wise to get marble of an exacting quality. Not the same story for the Washington Monument. So the Washington Monument, when uh, construction began, was um, limited, we'll say, to finding sources of marble that were close enough so that they could get from point A to point B. A lot of it had to be done by water, by barges, um, or overland. Um, but there was a quarry that was uh, close to Baltimore and it provided a uh, very nice quality marble. Everything was going great um, for the first 150 feet. And then there were some funding issues is the quick way to describe why construction halted um, for 25 years. No construction was happening um, on the exterior and it ended up that the quarry that the bottom part of the Washington Monuments marble came from was still active, was still um, issuing marble out to other projects. So when it came time to start again, 25 years later, there was not an exact color match. And there were a few courses that were um, a different quarry. And then they ended up going back to the same rock layer, but it was, um, a, a, you know, a few miles away. And so it was different enough that you can see the line there. So in this case, the geology of the marble used for the Washington Monument helps to record the history of construction, which is the history of funding, which is the history of politics, which is the history of transportation. Um, and 
you have on the bottom parts um, um, a marble called the Cockesville Marble from a little town called Texas, Maryland. And then you have just a few layers um, of Lee marble from Massachusetts. That didn't work well, although it was kind of a better color match, it um, wasn't as good of quality. So they go back to the Cockesville um, marble, but this time it's at a different quarry in Cockesville, Maryland. So that's kind of a fun way to look at types of rock. Um, but we can do something even a little different and more meaningful with the rocks that were used at the Lincoln Memorial. Let's take a look at where these were from. The kind of golden light that comes down from the ceiling tiles are thin, only like an inch or so thick slices of Alabama marble dipped in paraffin to make them more translucent. The statue of Abraham Lincoln is made out of marble from Georgia. Actually 28 separate blocks that are put together so well that you can hardly see any of the seams, especially from the front. Uh, there's Tennessee pink marble that forms the statue base and the floor. And then of course the Indiana limestone that we have already talked about um, that makes up the interior columns and walls. On the outside, we've got that Yule marble, that bright white marble on the outside from Colorado. And the steps and the foundations leading up to the Lincoln Memorial are the Massachusetts Milford pink granite for the steps to the plaza. So at the Lincoln Memorial, especially when we're thinking about these themes of being stronger together um, and recognizing and honoring uh, the president who helped to keep the, keep the country together, you could do a simple mapping exercise even of just going and circling the states or coloring in the states of where did the rocks from the Lincoln Memorial come from? And then you could layer on some history there of how does that fall for the Union or the Confederacy? How does that fall in how the country would look different had things gone differently during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln? So in that case, the rocks are really helping to strengthen that theme and idea of unity and union and coming together. So there's that kind of map. There's also this kind of map, my favorite. Um, this is a geologic map of the continental United States that has, uh, if you imagine all the buildings being scraped off and you know take off all of the um, pesky vegetation that grows everywhere. And then magically all the rock layers of the same ages and the same rock types become this like rainbow spread where the oranges and the pinks and the purples are the oldest and then the greens and the yellows are the youngest. Um, you start to see what's going on underneath the, the uh, underneath the ground, underneath the surface. And things can get a little interesting when you take a look at the underlying geology, matching it up with and influencing the geography and the topography, and then throw in humans um, and human development and see how that all plays together. So let's take a close up view of the geologic map. This is from the Geologic Resource Division of the uh, National Park Service. And you can see the very distinct kind of partial diamond um, of Washington DC, and then the little strings coming out for some of the parkways. And there are different color blobs. And then there are the keys that can tell you what those color blobs mean. So what I'd like for us to do is pay a little more attention to what's happening out on this edge. On the lower right-hand corner, you can see this green and this gray. And if 
you match it up to the key down here. And I apologize for this not being a resolution that you can actually read. Don't worry, your eyes are not fuzzy. This is a fuzzy image. Um, it's unconsolidated um, fluvial deposits and alluvium, which is a fancy word for stuff that gets left behind by rivers. And then the gray down here and down here um, is disturbed ground and artificial fill. We'll get to that again in a minute. Um, up in this stretch though, it's where things get kind of exciting. Look at all those stripes and it's older. It's much, much older rock. We take another view. This is um, courtesy of our friends in the International Space Station. And can you pick out, I'll give you a second to pick out Washington DC. Here, you can see, so coming up in the Chesapeake Bay, coming up the Potomac, and then, whoo, look at all that development. And then the thin line kind of continuing up. If you've ever flown um, across the Appalachian Mountains, you may have seen a scene like this, although not quite as high as an astronaut. Um, but there's all these ridges, ridges and valleys, ridges and valleys, ridges and valleys. And when you step back even further, to look a little wrinkled, it just looks like something got squished. And it did. We are part of the North American plate. Now we're going into um, the plate tectonic section of this, um, of this talk. The North American plate, South American plate, African plate, um, all these plates are chunks of the Earth's crust that I like to think of an orange. Um, Think of an orange and you know, if it's dinner time and you're snacking, you got one by you, you can try this as an experiment. Take the peel off of the orange, maybe in like a dozen pieces and then put it back around the orange and then start moving them around. As you move one, it's going to either rub up against one, another one or bump up against it, or it's gonna leave a gap. Very generally, that's what's happening with plate tectonics around the globe. You've got about a dozen chunks of the earth and they're moving in uh, different relationships to each other. The red line, I'm gonna use my little laser pointer right here. I'm going down a little red line that is in the Atlantic Ocean. That's a spreading center. Things are moving apart. New baby ocean crust is being formed and those plates are being pushed out about as fast as your fingernails grow. So not a lot but enough over time. We've got then this black line with the little triangles. Those are places where crust is coming together. And if it's ocean crust and land crust, continental crust, one will go down underneath the other and then it melts and comes up and forms volcanoes. That's real cool. Uh, or, you could get something like the Indian plate where it's continent crust and continent crust. They're pushing towards each other and they're building up like mountains. The Himalayan mountains are being formed and getting bigger all the time because those plates are still colliding. Uh, and then you could go to California, hang out on the San Andreas Fault and see a place, I think there's, those are marked with just a plain black line on this map where plates are sliding past one another and they get caught kind of like a broken zipper or something. It's a stuck zipper and the pressure is building up and then they slide past each other. So these plates are constantly in motion. And long story short, this is what it looks like now, but it's not what it always looked like. At one point, all the Earth's land mass was connected together in one giant supercontinent called Pangaea. And what you can see with the North American plate and the African plate is that they are smushed together and in fact, they were kind of like the Himalayas. They were smooshing and building mountains. If you can imagine it, the Appalachian Mountains could have been 20,000 foot mountains as big as the Himalayas. Just over time, the continents have rifted back apart again. So the ocean 
is um, between <laughs> these plates now. And everything started to erode back away. So that, I know that, was, that was a lot in a short time, but plate tectonics really for the Washington DC area, really you just have to remember things squished and then they eroded away. So in this satellite view of the Chesapeake Bay again, up in the left-hand corner, we got our squishy stuff. And those are really, really old rocks that were heated and pressurized and a lot of metamorphic rock, really hard rock was then formed. And then as the ocean got wider and things from the mountains came down and became the rock out in these coastal areas, this became places where new sedimentary rock was forming, bits and pieces of the Appalachians coming down and settling and forming and building and becoming rock as well. So we're getting the setup of hard old rock and young softer rock and rivers are making their way across the landscape like they do, um, trying to find the easiest path possible, which is find the high point, go to the low point and the ocean is the low point. Um, so things are going, things are going well for quite a while and the rivers are coming down, just finding a nice line, finding a nice line. Um, but then you can see that something, something's happening here. Like why, why don't these just go and follow a nice line? What's happening, you know, what's, what's happening up here that this is suddenly coming down this direction instead? Hold on to your hats. We got something big happening. 35 million years ago, a chunk, <laughs> a chunk of rock um, came and hit off of what is now close to the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, created a 50 mile wide, one mile deep impact crater that completely changed the, the flow of the water. It created a new low spot. And so rivers that had been just minding their own business, going across the coastal plain and entering into the ocean, suddenly were corralled and joined forces and cut a new path. And there's some sea level rise stuff that happens in here too, um, that, that uh, creates the shape and the size and the depths that we see today. But uh, that's a really cool and really hard to notice event that happened. Um, and it wasn't until people started seeking out freshwater sources, digging wells and finding salty water in their wells where they expected to find fresh water that, that something, something was going on. Somebody, somebody was thinking something's not quite right here. Uh, that goes back, um, I have a note that um, there were even some notes at Fort Monroe about salty water in wells. And so the meteor impact crater from 35 million years ago was actually uh, impacting the freshwater sources as people were trying to develop the land um, in this area. Uh, with better technology and more drill samples, it became more clear what the actual structure of the meteor impact crater was, and that's the image in the, the lower left there. Whew. All right, hopefully I didn't lose you in the whole plate tectonics part. <laughs> um, so now we're back to the, um, we're back to our cross section of the hard, wrinkly stuff in the Piedmont and in the mountains, and then the softer, younger stuff towards the ocean and making the coastal plain. And if you note, Washington DC placed as far up as you could go on the Potomac River before it starts getting too steep and rocky. And that's a really important, um, that's a really important reason why Washington DC is where it is, is because it just, the river was not um, easy to navigate past that point. Because there were big falls in the way. So Great Falls is where 
the water of the Potomac crosses that geologic line um, from the Piedmont into the coastal plain. And this is very hard rock, metamorphic rock. It's going into softer rock that is sandstone. Um, the best place to see this is just near the Washington Monument. There's the, these were the Capitol gates. And you can get a sense of the kind of like the really roughness of the sand and maybe even some of those layers as the sand was being washed down the mountains and across the coastal plain and building up and then becoming naturally cemented together. It just didn't have the staying power. It doesn't have the natural cement. It's not a great building stone, but it was local. It's what was available. Um, this is what was used for some of the, col the columns of the Capitol, which have been uh, removed and taken to the Arboretum. You can go and see them. They just hold up the sky now. Uh, this is what was also used at the White House. And needs a lot of care and restoration because this rock is just so much softer. You can compare it to the metamorphic rock, that really hard rock in Piedmont at the lock keepers, uh, the, 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 the house here. Um, and I just heard some really exciting news that there's some new educational experiences happening in this spot. Um, and not to dwell too much in it, but uh, this is, this is another really important part of the story of the geo story or the looking at the geology and the history of the Lincoln Memorial. It seems like we've gone off on a, a really wide tangent right here. Um, but this marking a spot and recognizing how much water there was and where the water was flowing in Washington, DC is a really important um, part of understanding why the Lincoln Memorial has another really kind of fun secret geological uh, story that we're gonna go and visit. So prior to the establishment of what we know now as the National Mall and what we have now as East Potomac Park and Haynes Point, the rivers were flowing across the landscape, including a uh, quite a bit of water coming down. <laughs> Here's the Capitol building. This is Constitution Avenue. Right that gatekeeper's house. A little bit later, this is from 1883, shows what could be in the designs for taking all of this. Remember that was not in this first photo. There's nothing here. Here's the White House. And then you go across and here's a river. Here's the Capitol. And there's just a bunch of water. So White House, Capitol, Washington Monument. That was the extent of the land. Until a reclamation um, a process of taking sand out of the bottom of the Potomac and piling it up behind sea walls um, was, was established. When we look at the map today, and we can see a lot of this green, all of this, East Potomac Park, the Tidal Basin, this part of the mall extending where the Lincoln Memorial is, all of this is made of sediment from the bottom of the river, creating the land, really getting it out of the way so you could still get ships up and down. Um, increased development in the Washington DC area meant increased erosion. And all of a sudden this very strategically located place where you could get ships in and out of um, was no longer because they were getting stuck on sandbars. So to clear that out, um, it also created an opportunity to have more land. And the um, concept of extending that park area out into the west for where the Lincoln Memorial would be um, also included this area here with a natural flushing uh, system where at high tide, the water would go up the Potomac River, come in, 
and then hang out, drop with sediment, and then fresh water gets flushed through the Washington Channel. So you could still always get a, um, you get things in and out of here without um, hitting bottom too much. You could still also with that dredging, make it up to Georgetown, which was important to um, connect in with the CNO Canal. So that's why when you look at some of the construction photos for the Lincoln Memorial, there is a really elaborate base. Uh, what we see here is only a portion. It actually had to go about as high as you see up. It had to go down below the surface because it was sitting on otherwise just sand and mud from the bottom of the river. And this is a heavy building with all of those rocks. Um, and that created a really kind of magical situation. Underneath the Lincoln Memorial, it's a fairly cavernous space. And under the plaza area, so as you're walking up the steps to the Lincoln Memorial, uh, little, little, little known <laughs> um, are all those little water droplets that are making their way down through the plaza picking up bits and pieces of calcium from the cement and then falling down underneath in this open space. As those calcium rich drops of water are dripping down, they are precipitating the calcium, leaving behind these streaks of white or these features called soda straws that you can find in a lot of other cave areas across the National Park Service. And one of my favorite little cave formations, I hope it's still there, um, is, I'll, I'll, I'll just call it a little, a little cave biscuit. Um, this is where drops of water are falling down and dropping onto the railing, a little wooden railing. And that calcium is left behind as the water evaporates. And little by little by little, it just keeps building and building and building. So. This has been a very quick look at how geology and art and earth sciences and history can come together. Uh, just, just amazing potential of what you could do um, to be inspired to look a little closer and dig a little deeper to find some new connections and perspectives. And there are so many stories, like most of the great stories that are just beneath the surface. So at this point, I will leave this beautiful USGS geologic map um, up and see what questions there may be. Oh, fun. Thank you, Sonia. Anybody have any questions to uh, pose to Sonia? Different way to think about the Lincoln Memorial. Very different and a great way. I was just watching another video today from a teacher who said, you don't have to say, um, you know, that that science is over now, it's time for history. It's like you can blend everything together. And, and this is a great example of that. Uh, Susan wants to know, is the memorial in danger of sinking? Mm, excellent question. Um, there is, <laughs> There's a lot going on underneath the memorial, and there are um, there are pylons that go down into bedrock. So I have not have not heard of any recent threats for sinking. Um, it's certainly something that all of the buildings uh, have some level of um, settling. Um, Jen, do you know of any? I've heard most recently the concern was more for Jefferson than Lincoln. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, when you look at the, that, and when you look at um, when you look at those maps of the where the placement of the Jefferson Memorial, I mean Jefferson is out in the middle of the Potomac, um, and there were and the the channels are deeper in different, in different spaces, so there may not have been the actual bedrock to pin into. Um, for there like there was. Um, yeah, great question. And I also see uh, the Pikes Peak granite 
for sure. Their, their uh, granite has a very distinct texture and mineral composition. And for a geologist, there is only certain things that fall into the category of being called granite. Um, and it has to do with how light it is or how much feldspar there is to mica. And for uh, one of the challenges when doing, when researching um, the building materials is that everybody likes a fancy name and granite sounds great. Nobody wants a gabbro um, countertop. They want a granite. So they start calling things black granite. Well, geologically speaking, there's no such thing as black granite because it would have a different mineral composition. It would fall into a different category of naming. Uh, also the pink Tennessee marble, it's um, not metamorphosed, uh, not, it's not recrystallized enough to technically be um, a metamorphic rock. And so it still, it still retains a sedimentary rock, limestone name, geologically speaking, uh, but it is hard and it, um, it polishes nicely. So for practical commercial purposes, that pink Tennessee marble goes by marble. Okay, Michelle wants to know, was the Washington Monument marble originally a better match? She heard once that the two marbles weathered differently and used to look more similar. Um, yeah, the, the quick, my super quick uh, dip back into the program I did 15 years ago research that I've been doing. <laughs> um, what, I, what I found was that the, 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 the actual geologic name for the marble um, that was used for the majority of the Washington Monument is the Cockeysville Marble. It's Precambrian in age and it's found near Baltimore. It's a fairly large exposure, but as things happen in nature, it's not all homogenous and things are different when they're being deposited as the, as the limestone, which is gonna be the source rock for that marble. So when it metamorphoses, it makes sense that something a mile away is a little bit different than something else, even though geologically speaking, it's the same, envir same environment, same time period. So it gets the same rock um, name. Um, uh, uh, here's my one note. Um, the Caucasville marble from Texas, which is the part from the lower one. So this is um, Texas, Maryland, was a nearly pure coarse grained calcium carbonate while the marble from Cockeysville is finer grained with some magnesium. So it is entirely possible that once you get a rock out of the ground, put it out into the elements and then have it weather, um, that different minerals are gonna show themselves in different ways and you can get surface staining and there um, yeah, can be a, quite a bit difference. If we were to slice off <laughs> the outside edges of the Washington Monument, not that I'm suggesting that we do that, uh, but the colors might look very different because it would be a fresh uh, surface instead of the weathered surface. Great, if we can squeeze in one more, we have one more. Sure. Um, Susan said, you mentioned that the limestone is alive. Mm -hmm. Can you provide any insight about what biological processes are happening in or on the stone of the memorials? Yes. Yeah. Nice. Easy little question for you. Oh, it's so wonderful. Um, <laughs> all right, to clarify, uh, fossils are really dead. Um, they are no longer alive. Um, they represent life. <laughs> uh, they are the, 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 the bits and pieces of creatures that had been living once. So um, the, the idea that the limestone is full of life, it's, um, the symbolic presence of life and not the active organically living creatures anymore. The calcium in the bodies of a lot of marine animals is the hard part that's left behind. And it is a wonderful natural cement. Um, it keeps things together. It, um, I, it forms that kind of glue <laughs> that holds the little pieces of sediment and mud altogether. So limestone is an incredibly strong um, resistant rock 
that gets used a lot. And it's fun because you can look for stuff and some of it's recognizable, crinoids, little Cheerios, those are easy to find, uh, but also uh, impressions of shells, um, which are a very, very obvious connection to sea life because we can see shells today too. Well, this was so cool. Thank you, Sonia, for yeah. um, for coming and joining us and sharing with us all this uh, geology stuff that uh, I have mostly forgotten about if I ever knew it. So um, I so appreciate you going back through the years to, you know, think back on all of this and, and share with us today and give us a different perspective completely on the um, on the whole science of the rocks and all. And I was taking notes, You know, next time uh, I'm giving a tour, I'm sure it will all feed into it. And how many of you wanna come and join me on a tour looking for Cheerios around the Lincoln Memorial? Anybody, <laughs> anybody? So um, thanks so much everybody for joining us. Um, we have one more, I can't believe we're at the end already, but we have one more session coming up in the third Wednesday in, in April. And uh, I think it'll be me and it will be, um, gosh, we had such a great, I so butchered it. We had such a great, um, in talking about this yesterday, Sonia was like, yes, I'm going to build this stage. And then you're going to, what did I say? You know, like talk about what happens on that stage. So we're going to look at, at the events, some of the more maybe well-known and maybe some of the not more well-known events that have happened at the Lincoln Memorial um, in, in commemoration of this hundred year anniversary, which will then take us to May, which I hope if you're, uh, close by, you're able to come and see some of the different programs we'll have going on throughout the month of May and some more virtual programming. And, um, yeah, this is a, this is a big year. So we're really excited to, to have this series going on. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Aaron, um, and the Trust for the National Mall for hosting. And, uh, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you, uh, next month. Thank you all. Have a good night.